for centuries, this is what agriculture looked like. It was tough, manual labor. Growing enough food for a growing population was a challenge, and it's what led Malthus to believe we were headed right into a catastrophe. He believed that since the population was increasing exponentially, but our food production was only growing in a linear fashion, that we'd hit a point where there wouldn't be enough food to feed everyone. But that never happened. Our actual trend in food production and population looks a little bit more like this. So what suddenly changed? The Green Revolution was a shift to new agricultural strategies in order to increase food production. And these included the use of mechanization with these giant machines, the introduction of genetically modified organisms or GMOs, the use of artificial fertilizers, pesticides, and improved irrigation techniques. Today, agriculture looks a lot more like this. Now, obviously, the mechanization of farming has increased profits for farmers and has been producing enough food to feed the world. But it has come at some costs, and a big one is the amount of ecosystems converted to farmland. This is the natural range of prairies and grasslands in the United States. And this is what's left. There is a 99% decline in tall grass prairies and a 68% decline in mixed grass prairies from its original historic range. Today, prairie grasslands are considered North America's most endangered ecosystem, primarily because of farmland conversion. But now we have all this farmland, which to be fair, it's not like it's inert ecologically speaking. While the crops are growing, croplands maintain water flow, as plants grow, they absorb atmospheric carbon, and some, well, non-pest species can make a habitat on farms so long as they don't affect the crops. But let's look at a few issues here. Most industrial agriculture is a monocrop, which is the practice of growing a single crop year after year on the same land. In the absence of rotating through other crops or perhaps growing multiple crops on the same land. We do this because it's easy to mechanize. Because everything is planted in even rows, it's easy to use a machine to prepare the land, plant the seeds, water, and later harvest it. The efficiency of monocropping results in about 80% of the world's food supply being produced in this way. Monocropping, however, diminishes any sort of genetic variation in a crop, considering you're planting one cultivar of one species that homogeneity increases the risk of plant diseases and pests. You see, if one plant gets infected with a fungus or bacteria or whatever, that can spread very quickly throughout the entire farm. This is partly why monocropping results in heavy pesticide use. A pesticide is a chemical that targets and kills a specific type of pest, and there's many different types of pesticides. Herbicides target weeds, which farmers use so other plants don't compete with their crop for resources. Fungicides target fungi. And there are a large number of plants that are susceptible to fungal infections, which are parasitic to some plants that would otherwise affect their growth, and in some cases, their safety, because sometimes some species of fungus are toxic to humans. Insecticides target insects that would otherwise, well, munch on the crops. Insects are usually responsible for the most crop damage, and a lot of this comes from these organisms called aphids, which feed on the sap from many crops, but also may act as agents of spreading plant disease around the farm. Another issue with high pesticide use is how they move up the food chain. Sure, it'll kill insects that ingest it, but that doesn't make the insects magically disappear. The insects are then eaten by other organisms, and those pesticides continue to concentrate in higher levels of the food chain. We call this phenomenon biomagnification. It's the increase in concentration of a substance per unit of body tissue that occurs in successively higher trophic levels of a food web. We've seen this before with the pesticide DDT, where DDT accumulated in the Chesapeake Bay food webs and put bald eagles on the endangered species list. Many pesticides after a while become less effective over time, right? Any population of pests may have members that have a resistance to the pesticide. The insects that are affected die off, but the remaining resistant population increases well through the process of natural selection. 
After some time, you'll have a population of pests that can no longer be killed off by pesticides. We now have a large number of species that are totally resistant to many of our most powerful pesticides. Because you're planting only one type of crop, the nutrient extraction from the soil is very high. Planting the same crop over and over again depletes the soil of nutrients a lot faster. This results in the increased use of synthetic fertilizer, which, to be fair, if the fertilizer stayed in place, wouldn't be much of an issue. However, because of water runoff, the fertilizer enters nearby bodies of water, leading to the dead zones we've mentioned before in an earlier video. So how do we solve these issues? The modern use of pesticides is heavily regulated and many farmers take an integrated pest management approach. In this way, they use many different methods to control pests. This may include using physical controls such as traps and the introduction of natural predators of the pests into the farms. An example of a biological control is ladybugs. See, ladybugs are natural predators of aphids and the use of all these different control systems reduces our reliance on chemical pesticides. Integrated pest management reduces the risk of pesticides to wildlife, human health, and local water quality, which minimizes the environmental disruptions of agriculture. We can also reduce the need for pesticides by crop rotation, where farmers will plant a different crop each growing season. This way, it's harder for a population of pests that target any one particular crop species to grow in large enough numbers that would require excessive pesticide use. Crop rotation also reduces the amount of fertilizer a farmer may need to use as different crops will assimilate nutrients at different rates, reducing the overall load we put on our soils. Plants can also be genetically engineered to produce their own pesticides. Bacillus thuringiensis is a naturally occurring bacterium in the soil that produces proteins specifically active against many insects. Some crops, such as corn, cotton, and soybeans, have been genetically engineered to express the Bt gene that acts as its own insecticide. One way to manage pesticide and fertilizer runoff is to plant buffer zones along rivers and bodies of water near farms. This way, less runoff actually makes it into the bodies of water, preventing the spread of farm chemicals into aquatic ecosystems. But it's the need to conserve soil that is the top priority in sustainable agriculture. Whether there are pests or not, we can't grow large amount of crops without soil. And soil erosion is a global problem. I've mentioned it briefly before, but let's get slightly more into the details here. We already learned that soil erosion is a result of plants being removed from soil. So let's look at why agriculture is a leading cause of soil erosion. See, after harvest, large plots of land are left barren, and roots don't survive long without the rest of the plant providing sugar from photosynthesis. This barren landscape makes the soil susceptible to erosion as any rain and wind can just blow the soil away. Uh, one solution to this is cover cropping, where a farmer plants something in the off season to keep the soil in place. But this comes with one other added benefit. A good choice of cover crop is a legume like a red clover. The red clover is hardy enough to withstand winter in most parts of the United States, and studies have shown that a red clover cover crop can supply the equivalent nitrogen load of 160 pounds of fertilizer. Red clover and many legumes form a close symbiotic relationship with nitrogen-fixing bacteria. The bacteria receive sugar products from the roots of these plants and, in turn, fix a bunch of nitrogen. They end up fixing more nitrogen than the plants could possibly use, so a lot of it is left in the soil for the next growing season. Another cause of soil erosion in farms is actually in how farmers prepare the fields. Tilling is something farmers do to prepare a field for planting. It brings nutrients that are deeper into the soil and incorporates them back up, and it loosens the soil, making it easier for plant roots to grow. It's the loosening of the soil that is the issue. The loose top layers of soil are now susceptible to erosion. Many farmers now use a low till system, which doesn't go quite as deep. And while that's great for soil erosion, it does slightly increase the need for fertilizer use. More farms are beginning to utilize other forms of soil erosion prevention. The most common method is contour plowing, which is the practice of plowing or planting across the slope following the elevation contour lines of a land area. 
These contour lines create a water break, which reduces the amount of soil eroding, especially during times of heavy water runoff. Some farmers may even utilize a polyculture where more than one plant is on the same field. An example of this is agroforestry, which sees trees planted into the farm. These trees act as a windbreaker, reducing the amount of erosion due to wind, and also serve to keep the soil in place when the crops are not on the field. They also serve to absorb excess water that would otherwise run off and also contribute to erosion. Here is what erosion looks like. Sheet erosion is when surface water and wind blows thin layers of soil from the top. Rill erosion is when the water running off creates these little rivulets which create fast moving water which drags soil along with it. Rill erosion that's left unsolved can lead to gully erosion, which occurs when really fast flowing water streams join together to create these deep gullies and ditches. This is a positive feedback system. The deeper and wider these gullies get, the faster water can flow, which creates a deeper ditch, so on and so forth, which increases the rate of soil erosion. As soon as erosion is detected, farmers should immediately plant a quick-growing plant, like grass, to prevent the issue from getting worse, or, if possible, fill in the area with a clay-heavy soil to slow down the water. Little check dams like this can also be used to slow down the flow of water and potentially trap soil. The last topic I want to cover is irrigation, or how we water our crops. Though estimates vary and different regions will have very different breakdowns, the generally accepted number is about 70% of our water use is for irrigation. Flood irrigation is when an entire field is flooded with water. This system sees about 20% of water loss to evaporation and runoff, but it is one of the cheapest methods of irrigation. Furrow irrigation involves cutting furrows between rows of crops and filling them with water. However, because the water is pretty much always there, it sees about one-third of all water loss to evaporation and runoff. The benefit is that this system is also relatively inexpensive. Spray irrigation is probably the most common form of irrigation I see in Illinois. It's when water is pumped into spray nozzles across a field. This system is quite efficient, seeing about less than 25% of water lost to runoff and evaporation, but it is a little bit more expensive and does require energy to run the pumps, but it's a fair trade-off when you're looking at water conservation. Drip irrigation is the most efficient type of irrigation, with only about 5% of water being lost to evaporation and virtually none to runoff. It uses perforated hoses to release small amounts of water directly to the plant root. However, this is very expensive and is rarely used outside of very small-scale operations. We've seen one issue related to irrigation, and that's the depletion of aquifers. Another is waterlogging, which occurs when too much water is left in the soil, raising the water table. This inhibits a plant's roots' ability to absorb oxygen through the roots. This is quite a common issue with flood and furrow irrigation. Another issue with over-irrigation is soil salinization, which occurs when salt remains in soil after water evaporates. See, even fresh water has small amounts of salt in it, especially if it's pumped from a groundwater source. So over time, this salt builds up and can reach a concentration that is toxic to plants. Now, this can be solved by flushing the soil with desalinated water, but that is a very expensive solution, and it uses a lot of water. Underground drainage systems can also be installed, but that's also expensive. Generally, when this problem occurs, many farmers will just switch to growing salt-tolerant crops like barley or beets, which can still grow in soils that are saturated with salt. I understand that the content of this video went by relatively quickly and contained a lot of information. Uh, this doesn't even scratch the surface of how modern agriculture works, and the reason this video is a bit longer is because, well, my kids are city kids, so there's not as much personal life experience that we have with agriculture. And to be honest, when I began teaching this class, I ended up putting myself through a crash course on agriculture, and I studied environmental science! So whether you're using this as background before a class or as review before a test, I hope it helped your knowledge grow. Ha, more puns.
Puns with Mr. W.